Fuck the duck until exploded. Hello and welcome to the China Podcast. Hello. It's been a few weeks. It has been a little while, yeah. Since our our last recording. Um, we were on a bit of a, a hiatus. Yeah. I kind of feel like a, like a rock star when I say that. Yeah, we were, we, were, we were taking a break. We were having a hiatus. We were, yeah. you know, reassessing situations and all that sort of stuff. And now yeah. we're back with our, our new single. Yeah. yeah. Comeback. Yeah. Comeback single. Yeah. Comeback hour. New album coming out soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, stay tuned for the video. Indeed. Um, so, yeah. How is everybody doing? Um, yeah, we, we're, we're into spring now. Yeah. Well just, underway, spring. Yeah. Come summer. Winter just disappeared, just like... Just like that. that. And as it happens in Chongqing. Yeah. And in a lot of places over China. Um, yeah, summer just comes at a blast. Yeah. I got the, I got the train on Sunday and I came... I was wearing my big heavy coat. And on Monday, I went into work and I was wearing a, a lighter coat. Mm-hmm. By eleven o'clock in the morning, it was that was off, and I was just wearing a shirt. Yeah, you know. and now it's t-shirt weather. And now it's t-shirt weather. Yeah, like, um, and, uh, like earlier today, you know, I was thinking I could put on a pair of shorts. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was uh, two weeks ago. I was wearing a coat. Yeah, yeah, and now it's just now it's just sunshine. Just we, buying sun cream and glorious sunshine. Temperatures in the mid twenties, and yeah. they're going to go up and yeah. up and up. Twenty eight degrees right now. Yep. And it'll stay that way all the way through to October. It will, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, seven or eight months of summer, more or less. Yeah. Um, a week of spring, and then... And and that's how it is, like, in most places in China, you you got two seasons. Yeah. And there's very little transition in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a week, maybe two weeks at most. Yeah. But it's great. Uh, I like it. I actually like it, but I just wish that the winter was a little bit warmer. You know, like inside the houses. Inside, you know? and that's because of the lack of central heating. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. you are too far south in China. Yeah, when you're too far south, there's they're just concrete blocks. They're they're made to lose heat. Yeah. So the houses down here are generally cooler in the summer, mm-hmm. but then they're absolutely freezing in the winter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and the cold it goes through you, it sticks to your bones. Yeah. Follows you around. Yeah, it wouldn't be a bad place to have. It wouldn't be a good place to have rheumatism. No, no, it would not. Um, so yeah, last time we were talking about comedy. Um, that was the first part. Yes. Of stand up comedy in China. Yeah. Um, and today we're going to talk a bit bit more about comedy. We are indeed. Um, own you've performed since. I have. In fact, you performed last night a stand up gig. I did. T- tell us how how did it go? Um, well, I was I was I was thinking about it a lot actually, and I put it I put an awful lot of preparation into it, and I was trying to gauge the audience and what they got what the audience expected from me as a performer, rather than just getting up there and telling jokes that I think are funny. I wanted to tell I wanted to appeal to them, so what I I, I took on a role. I assumed the role of an English teacher because there's an awful lot of Chinese people there who maybe their language isn't that isn't good enough to get the implications or the nuances of the the gist, of, the gist of the jokes. Yeah, exactly. So I was over explaining. Uh, I was over explaining words and concepts, but I was I was over over ex- in the process of over explaining these concepts. I was sticking in a joke, sticking yeah. in a joke, sticking in a joke, and then all of the, all of them mashing together to a to a a, a, a big punchline at the end. You know, um, it was really good. It was really good. But that was just that was me. Now I think I did a good job, but I was in tears. I was in tears with the rest of them. Yeah, I mean, we we spoke just before we we started recording and. Um it strikes me that here in Chongqing we've got such a a range of different styles. Yeah. For each comedian that that gets up on stage and delivers their routine. Yeah, absolutely. We've got you've got the absurd. You've got the 
clean you've got the the dark you've got the me which is more more of a conversational sort of a style mm-hmm. um you've got the one liners um yeah so some of the one liners that that Stephen does are Stephen and Danny they're they're great there was a couple of a couple of other lads throw through in a few one liners as well which are were pretty good um but there are the and physical comedy as well um Luke is just Luke is just crazy like he's he's just crazy he's brilliant I love him yeah so he's using props he's using props he always uses props yeah. and you know moving around moving around the stage and mm. you know he, he, yeah it's just good you know and sometimes he'll just bring out a guitar and just start playing tunes or or a box he just start making a beat on a box yeah know? and uh, of course he opened um, the other week for a fella called Adam Hamilton yeah who came down to Chongqing yeah he did yeah. Um, and that was a big hit it, apparently it was a, a big hit yeah everyone was um, waxing lyrical about the 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 abilities of Mr. Hamilton I am very disappointed I didn't get to see it myself um, but by all accounts uh he, by all accounts, he was brilliant. He was well able to control the room, and he and he knew where the laughs were, and he knew how to get the laughs. He's a, a, like a seasoned comedian. Yeah, but it 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 goes to show the strength of comedy right now in China. Oh yeah, when you've got this guy who's you know biggish name amongst the foreign comedy community yeah. in in yeah. China, and he's coming, he's willing to come to a another city yeah. and perform and probably go elsewhere again yeah, yeah, yeah. on he, somewhat of a tour I don't know if he yeah, calls yeah. it a tour ah, he's just, if, that, if that's his thing I think um, it probably is his thing you know but I mean it's the same for so many other comedians like him yeah there are there are that they will will go from city to city for, yeah and, and perform yeah and of course the the comedy scene in, in Chongqing here isn't probably it, it, well it isn't it isn't as big as in Shanghai or in Beijing or even somewhere which is, which might be seen as a little bit more um, touristy, uh, like Dali or something like that. There, the, yeah. There's a big, there are big comedy scenes in the bigger cities. Mm-hmm. And then once you move outside of the bigger cities, um, disposable income becomes lower. So you tend to get less comedy. But Chongqing, it's picking up. It's picking up. Yeah, and you know, it's it strikes me that we've got such a, a tight knit community. Yeah, but it's growing. Yeah, it, it is, and growing, it's growing yeah. very quickly. Yeah. Um, since you know, it was the first time that you performed in December, yeah. uh, and we both went down there to Nuts. Yeah. Um, the um, the the club where where, where the comedy takes place, or one yeah. of the clubs where the, the comedy takes place. Yeah. Um. And you know that day they were kind of they were short of performers. Yeah, they were. Yeah, um, there was they had a few promises, but the, no shows. There were yeah. no shows. Um, but then other people got on and and they they tried it out. And since then, since then there, the there, roster has been growing and growing and growing. There hasn't been a, there hasn't been a no show since then. Um, mm. There hasn't been a no show. Well, there were the following one, the one, the, the second one. There was there was a guy that didn't didn't make it. The third one. There were too many people looking to p- perform, yeah. um, and then last night, which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, yeah. It shows the interest and absolutely, like we had a it's encouraging, a, very a, encouraging, a full lineup, and then two subs, you know, yeah, um, which is is great. It's wonderful, yeah. And then, yeah, and then last night we had a, a a full lineup again, and we even we even let a guy go up, um, like he didn't put his name down. We. we it's not Mike. He, he said he had jokes, so we we let him go up. Um, hopefully, he'll come back because um, he was he was pretty funny, yeah. Yeah, and it's a good mix too of locals and foreigners. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, it, it mostly the audience, the audience is mostly Chinese. Yeah, the audience is mostly Chinese. Um, the performers. If I go through yesterday, how many? We actually had less Chinese performers yesterday than we normally do. We had four and then eight foreigners. That's not too bad. That's all right, yeah. Yeah. Like, we'd nor- it'd normally be six and six, yeah. you know? Um, but, yeah, it's, it is a good mix. It, it, it shows the the cross-cultural appeal. Absolutely, um, yeah. 
Um, and it's and it's comedy at the end of the day. Yeah. It's just, it's, people want to want to have a laugh. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. You just wanna, it's also kind of evidence of what we were talking about in, in the podcast last time about yeah. the comedy scene and you know how it's growing, um, not just amongst foreigners but but, but local people as well, and their willingness to get involved and not not just not just to watch the shows but to actually get up on stage and and take and take part in it and yeah talk about issues that are not just chinese but global issues too it's, it's really encouraging you know um there are a, a couple of taboo topic topics that, mm. that, that pop up every now and then you know yeah like every now and then somebody will start talking about the size of the penis or you know something there'll, there, there'll be something that isn't in the the, the daily the day-to-day -day conversation yeah. you know and it's a it's a place where people go to to kind of just to let off steam to just let off steam yeah you know it's a great thing yeah you know uh and you know we've we spoke before about having china days yeah and this is a perfect setting to just to just get rid wipe, of it wipe it all off just wipe it clean wipe the plate clean yeah you exactly. just when everything's just coming uh, coming down on top of you and you feel so small mm. to just laugh yeah yeah it just it just makes you feel good to speak about your experience yeah and laugh about it yeah, rather yeah. than go that go down a, an angrier route yeah 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 that's that's the thing and then that, that's the way i was feeling yesterday actually as well and i think everybody was feeling it. and i think the sunshine had a lot to play with it mm. to 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 play had 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 uh, had a big part to play in it yeah because everybody was just wearing t-shirts um just relaxing drinking a cocktail and then just letting themselves go just and it was all positive it was all upbeat and it was it was great so where we left you guys last time was talking about uh, comedians with experience in Western countries trying to bring a new form of comedy to China. Yeah, we spoke about Des Bishop, um, an Irish American comedian, Dashan, and Joe Wong, and yeah. the troubles that some comedians had coming to China and performing stand up in a country that is, for the most part, not English speaking. Um, but we paid particular attention to the three guys because they were intent on promoting stand up in Chinese. Uh, which they achieved to varying degrees of success. Yeah, and we also mentioned Xiansheng or crosstalk, which is the traditional form of Chinese stand-up comedy. Um, and that was seen as outside the language capacity for most native speakers, let alone foreigners. Um, there is one guy who we didn't mention, and he goes by the name of Jesse Appel. Jesse Appel is a Fulbright Scholar alumni whose research focuses on Chinese humour and performance. He's a disciple of master Xianchang performer Ding Guang Chuan and regular perform regularly performs uh, Xianchang, bilingual improv comedy and Chinese stand-up live and on TV as well. Yeah, um, you might have seen him on social media, media. you might not. Um, he's a pretty big deal in China on Doin and the local platforms. He has millions of followers. Um, however, in the West, his YouTube inversely has 30,000 followers. Yeah, these last 10 years, he has essentially been a full-time cultural ambassador uh, using comedy to help non-Chinese learn more about China and, and Chinese more about the West. Um, creating quality interaction online and in person between the peoples of different countries especially those with increasingly closed media spheres, which he sees as incredibly important. Now, for some perspective, he considers every foreign person in China as essentially an interlocutor or a go-between for China and the Western world. Most of the people in China will never go to a foreign country, and most of the people in foreign countries will never come to China. So we, speaking for myself and Eric here, as expats, are the first and last exposure that they will ever get to foreign ideals. And it's something that he is really passionate about. Bringing people together with person-to-person -person diplomacy. And that's interactions with everyday people in their language and trying to understand them from their perspective. 
Right. To give you some context of what people-to-people diplomacy is, one of the earliest forms of person-to-person diplomacy between China and the West was called ping-pong diplomacy. America sent a team of table tennis players to China, and they just played games for fun. Um, These games were not competitive. They were just touring China, playing with normal people and talking to the locals. They went to see the sites and were accepted across China. This is back in 1971, and ultimately helped pave the way for Nixon to visit, that's President Nixon, and China to open up to the West. Yeah, and so you have to ask yourself, why did it work? There's a few reasons. Firstly, it's a simple idea. And everyone is everyone in China has played or plays ping pong. And then further to that, the games weren't competitive. Nobody cared who won. It simply didn't matter. Games were won and lost on both sides and nobody counted. There are pictures of Ameri- of the American table tennis team playing games against guys in suits who just happened to be there. And finally, ping pong is fun. It's a it's a fun game. There's no ulterior motive. Yeah, people-to-people diplomacy shows that people-to-people relations allow cooperation which creates true friendships, real-life friendships, and garners mutual respect as everyone just wants to have a good time. It is these friendships that stabilizes international cooperation in times of trouble. If you know someone who is from an area that is going through strife, you are invested in their well-being and you are concerned for that person. Now, if we blow that up to a larger scale, we get situations where people in China, who probably previously uh, couldn't point to Ukraine on a map, know Ukrainian people and Russian people, and those Chinese people have a genuine concern for what's going on in the region right now. And the people who have no exposure to, to Russians or Ukrainians, they really couldn't give a flying fuck. They have no personal investment in these places and they're just words on the TV in the same way that most of America couldn't care less about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan because they just don't know anything about these places. Yeah, but time moves on. And and that was just an example, by the way. Um, We don't live in a world where we have to watch a couple of guys playing table tennis on TV to get to know the rest of the world. So... How does person-to-person diplomacy work now? We have social media, of course. We have videos. We have podcasts that people can listen to um, or watch at their leisure. We now live in a world where gratification is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And yet we can still feel disconnected from the creators of this content The people become faces on a screen or voices in our ears. In a strange way, the more we are connected, the more distance we actually put between us. But there is a tendency to see something online and just take it as fact. And But that's not everyone. That's very true, yeah. But we all know the the people who buy into the political memes in the world. In the West, you have people who are anti-vax because of something they read on Facebook. Uh, maybe they're against immigration or gun control or abortion or any of a litany of things which do not deserve to be summarized and taken as gospel truth um, by a meme on the internet. This happens and this uh, can hinder person-to-person diplomacy because it is not real people who create this content. There is a motive behind all of this uh, and it's depressing. And it becomes very easy to get sucked into the echo chamber of the internet. Like whatever half-baked opinion you form, you will find someone somewhere that agrees with you. And this is a very dangerous thing. Now let's bring this back to Jesse. There was a time in 2020 when COVID had not reached America. And during that time, Jesse performed a stand-up show in his high school in America. which is where he had moved back to after eight years in China. And the reason for this show was to raise money for the people who were suffering in Wuhan. And he released this on the internet. And the show got 400 million views. The Chinese police even put it up on the website. 
And this was the only piece of culture in the entire history of the world that was forwarded by both NPR in America and the Chinese police. It was, uh, it was an example of this form of diplomacy in times of absolute horror. If we were to look at relations between the US and China over the course of the pandemic, it's fair to say that they were not always in the best of spirits from both sides. Yeah. And so Jesse's driving question, as he said himself, is how do you do something that everybody likes that will lead to effective people to people diplomacy? And Jesse's reach in China is absolutely massive. He has hundreds of millions of views on TikTok or Douyin, which is the Chinese equivalent. And this brings us to a very interesting point in the social media age that we now live in. For better or worse, we as individuals do not get a choice as to who the cultural ambassadors for our respective countries are. What Jesse himself calls is the democratization of diplomacy. Anyone that goes to a restaurant and makes a video and posts it online is now a diplomat. And the impact the video makes is unknown and has the ability to influence an argument on the other side of the world. And these online interactions, we, we, have, the intera we have the ability to interact with them in real time. We can, we can like, we can share, we can comment, subscribe and judge the influence of these occurrences immediately. And this gives us the opportunity to create communities online. And if you think about what sort of videos you see online, you get cooking shows and music shows and cultural shows and basically whatever you want. There are videos out there for you and you can get them whenever you want. And there are, of course, some really nasty corners of the internet that just perpetuate stereotypes and do not allow a free and open discussion. If you go to YouTube and type in, is China safe? Which you think is a reasonable question that most people would have before coming to China. On the first page, you get an absolute smorgasbord of titles. Here's just a few examples from the first 10 videos. Is China actually safe? Here's what happens if China invades Taiwan. I swear, this is the third video. China is the safest country in the world. Another one. No food is safe in China. You have no guarantee. How do you stay healthy? And last example, China. Is it as safe as people say? Yeah, so who decides which one to watch? You can't watch them all. Like for me, if I were looking for the answer to that question, I'd just say fuck it and roll the dice. Listen to some music instead and just ignore a lot of them. Like, these videos can't all be made in good faith. Some don't actually mean to help you. The videos that Jesse puts up don't have that slant. He deliberately decides to avoid all this bullshit, uh, all this extra baggage. Yeah. Um, the people in his videos are the people who are invested in the interactions. He tries to help from the perspective of a person, a person who cares. Yeah. There is no agenda. You don't have to ask who profits from the interaction because it's clear. The Chinese get a good show. Jesse gets the clicks and the likes and the follows. Some people put up videos because they think that they can get clicks if they say horrible things about China. They want to shout into the echo chamber. Or, inversely, they are made by a group who want to put content out, who want to make China look good, and other countries to look bad. And it becomes very unclear about who actually profits from these videos. Yeah, so let's bring this all back to the video that we were talking about that Jesse put up. It was about raising money for Wuhan. A month later, the virus reached America. Now, after sending 90,000 yuan worth of supplies to Wuhan, Jesse found himself in the situation where he needed to get face masks in America. And wouldn't you know, he was inundated with offers from offers of masks from all over China. And they were supplied to homeless shelters and hospitals and various other places all over Boston. And this was a triumph of social media. And it was proof positive that people to people interaction is vital to the advancement of society as a whole. 
He doesn't mention Xi Jinping. Doesn't mention Biden. None of his videos are political. Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, they're important men. They have a political role to fulfill. To fulfill. But through stand-up comedy, Jesse crosses the divide of borders and appeals to the very humanity of China and Chinese people. Yeah, what was it he says again? Be the meme you want to see on your feed. Yeah, if you want to have a laugh, make people laugh. Yeah. Now, Jesse actually worked with Des Bishop, that Irish comedian we spoke about at length last week, um, when he came to China. And he was a founder of a comedy club in Beijing called Laugh Beijing and puts the mission of the comedy club like this. Laugh Beijing is about connecting China and other cultures through comedy. When we laugh together, we learn about each other. When we learn about each other, we live better together. It's pretty simple. Also pretty funny. I'm Jesse Appel. Laugh Beijing is my project. And he was very successful at doing it. At one point, they were, they were putting on 300 shows a year. That is five days off every month. That's a lot of shows. That is a lot of shows. But there is one of the comedians who we spoke about last week who was even more successful than that. Putting on more shows and attracting an even wider audience. Joe Wong. He's the Chinese guy who went to Texas and ended up going to the correspondence dinner at the White House. Yeah, that's him. In 2010, um, Wong addressed the White House correspondence dinner and famously roasted the then Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, Wong said to Biden, um, I actually read your autobiography. Today I see you. I think the book is better. It was a, just a simple little joke. But for comedians in China, they saw one of their own on the biggest stage for stand-up comedians, giving it to the second most powerful man in America. This was their time. This was something they could do. And after that, stand-up comedy really only ever increased in popularity all across China. Yeah. Now, the rest of this story is about a TV show, essentially. Joe Wong is the biggest name in Chinese stand-up comedy, but the TV show where Joe was actually once a contestant is the main focus. According to Tencent, an average of 70 million viewers watch the TV show Rock and Roast in China. Um, this is a stand-up comedy show broadcast in Chinese for the Chinese audience. It is a sort of reality show. Contestants compete to be voted the funniest. So... What does this have to do with Joe Wong, I hear you ask, aside from his being a contestant? Well, when Joe Wong came back to China in 2013, he had a scriptwriter named Li Dan, a stand-up comic himself. Li Dan was one of the founders of a company called Fun Factory, or the Xiao Guo Culture Company. Fun Factory also produces another well-known show, Roast. If you think the numbers for rock and roast are impressive, and they are, um, roast, which was first broadcast in 2016, is the Chinese version of the American comedy series on Comedy Central, which is also called Roast, where celebrities take in turn to mock each other. And the show rapidly became one of the most influential stand-up comedy shows in China. The first season was viewed over 1.38 billion times by the time its final episode was aired in March 2017. And around 70% of reviewers gave it four or five stars on Doban. And when it's on, it trends on all social media platforms. Now, this show is not without its controversy. As we all know, stand-up comedy is subjective. There are people who will take offence to the content. Roast has been no stranger to public attention over the last number of years and has had the broadcast of a number of episodes delayed or even cancelled, sparking debate about how comedy will develop in China. An episode that caused furore may well have been the most popular of all since Roast's debut, with the hashtag Best Ever Roast winning over 200 million views on Weibo after it aired. And it involved a former soccer player 
roasting the Chinese basketball team. Now, this former soccer player is called Fan Zhe and he took aim at a player called Joe for a misplaced pass in the last seven seconds of a match at the 2019 Basketball World Cup, which in turn cost the Chinese basketball team their place at the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. He said, I can pass the ball to others with my feet. You can't even do it using your hands. He also had a joke about a player named Guo, whose performance in scoring just one point in a match against Venezuela during that same tournament. He said, it's not easy to get only one point in a basketball game. It would be pretty hard for a professional basketball player who plays a full game to get just one point. Yeah, because there's not many players on the field, Yeah, and on the court even. Yeah. Um, and his joke wasn't taken in the best of spirits from all sides. He was forced to stop presenting a conference about basketball because of the backlash that he received. It seems that some people just didn't get the joke. Yeah, and that wasn't the first time either. Um, the show was shut down within three days of its first episode in July 2016, supposedly because of its use of dirty jokes, and only reappeared um, half a year, six months later. Chinese, Chinese comic Tony Cho, he said about this in 2019 when he was comparing it to the American version of the show. He said, in the Chinese model of roast, you must worry about the audience, the sponsor, as well as the government. Producing something that all three can agree on is a nearly impossible task. There, and there have been attempts to reel in the scope of the humour. And some people have even said that they're whitewashing, dumbing down the, the, the humour in the show. But still the comics, they keep trying to say what they want. Yeah. For example, in December 2020, a 28-year-old stand-up comic, Yang Li, was reported to the National Radio and Television Administration, which is China's broadcasting regulator, um, for sexism, spreading hatred and instigating social conflict. She's a woman. And this was because of her jokes about men, which included comments such as, do men have any bottom line? And men are rubbish. The backlash against her has persisted with technology company Intel pulling down advertisements which featured Yang after she received fierce criticism online from some male netizens. Yang received more abusive online comments last March when she promoted a brand of sanitary pads via live stream. Yeah, bunch of lads complaining that they can't use them, so chop their dicks off and use them to wash up the blood. That's a bit harsh. But I can say it because I'm a man and I agree with Joe Wong mm. on this one. It's yeah. I agree with Joe Wong on this one. It's okay for Yang Li to ridicule domineering men. This is what he said. It's okay for Yang Li to ridicule domineering men. She's joking about men who have no bottom line. Her jokes, prob her jokes probably don't gain their approval because many men have blind spots about their own actions. Um, that's what he said. And like I say, they are jokes. And Chinese women seem to have really taken to her. And the broadcasters agree too, to, to varying degrees. The two biggest state players, um, Xinhua and CCTV, they weighed into this discussion about Yang Li's jokes. Um, now, Xinhua urged athletes to learn from their past mistakes instead of laughing them off. They're not, and CCTV suggested that audiences distinguish the program's light-hearted banter from real hostility and not to read into jokes on a show that are specifically designed to make people laugh. And Roast remains popular, in parts because of its controversial nature. Both professionals and audiences are still exploring the best way to adapt um, what is a very provocative American concept to Chinese society. The irreverent and often brutal style of roasting from the US is unlikely to make it onto Chinese screens. Um, but the slow burn of Chinese comedy will continue and perhaps eventually everyone will learn how to take a joke. Yeah, shows like this are causing controversy. 
but they are contra- they are creating discussion points within China amongst Chinese people, which was the whole idea in the first place. So the production company, what does it entail? Altogether, 14 sub-brands extended from Xiaogo between 2016 and 2021. Comedians under Xiaogo grow and thrive via open mic nights held in Xiaogo cafes and comedy shows produced for online audiences. Cast members, the comedians, earned big names and big money through comedy tours, celebrity endorsements and regular payments from Xiaogo itself. One reason the comics can earn so much. It's not a cheap day to watch a comedy show, right? A, a ticket for a stand-up gala costs 80 yuan on average in 2019. And now it's over 200 yuan, which is about $30, give yeah. or take. Yeah. Um, if you're fast enough to grab it once released, that is. Yeah. So what's behind the promising market then? Um the, the market is wide and it's an enthusiastic audience. Those in their 20s and 30s living in top tier cities such as Shanghai and Beijing, they're willing to pay to laugh. And given their higher salaries and the, the pressure that they face in their daily life, they need stand up comedy as a shelter to retreat from sometimes harsh realities. This the comedy industry um, builds on them, on their aspirations, on their complaints, on their joys, on their tears. They're young adults and they, they come to stand up comedy for a place to talk about taboos without offending any group or breaching any social norms. They feel prickly at cases of prejudice and discrimination and inequality. And they see they see comedy as a as a vent for the unexpressed these perspectives they're they're valued far beyond humor yeah and the valuation of the leading comedy club Xiao Guo company in 2019 it's 3 billion yuan that's 470 million dollars that is big big money yeah that's massive um for a comedy company huge um and i don't think that they're going to go anywhere anytime soon for I wouldn't say so. No. Um, But yeah, we are. Um, We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Thank you as ever for listening. Um, Yeah, this was our first podcast in three weeks, something like that. So um, we don't like when we don't put out a a, a new podcast every week. This is, no, I didn't like it at all, to be honest. we will we will get back into the rhythm of of putting them out consistently. Um, health willing health willing health willing indeed Um, do the like and subscribe thing and don't be afraid to contact us toodles